welcome to Once More With Feeling, Strange Attractor, newest album from Alphaville. Um, so yeah, this was a blind pick again. Didn't know the band before choosing the album, uh, hadn't heard anything about it, and once again was served pretty damn well by that. The real question is, how do we not know about this band, since they've been around longer than we have? I don't know, I mean... Yeah, this band has been around since 1982. They're contemporaries with the Eurythmics and Aha. And it's sort of like, how did we just find out about them? I mean, we look up old music all the time. As much as you may have guessed from some of our reviews, we also like, you know, 80s style synthwave and synth pop and stuff like that. But these guys very much are, at least in part. Yeah. Parts of it, it's sort of like. Okay, and did this become a hard rock album? Wait, now it's disco funky. What? It does change around a lot. That's great. Um, yeah, what we have been able to find out about the band, which it's mainly the band we've been able to find out stuff about. We've we've only been able to find out very limited information with regards to the album. There's only like two sentences on the Wikipedia entry and it's only been out a couple of days, so Yeah. Um there's only sort of like the bare bones information on the iTunes page, you know, who it's licensed under and all that sort of thing. Um But hey, uh it does seem as though a couple of singles have been released for it, so so, once again, have not managed to hear at all, but that's probably because I don't, you know, actually listen to radio very much. Mm. And when I've been constantly looking for new music recently, I've been more towards uh, other genres, mostly metal, so I wouldn't necessarily have picked up on this at the time. Yeah. Which is kind of sad, because I wish I had, because it's pretty great. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've actually been able to find the various albums of theirs for download, so I'm going to be going through... Uh, I mean, fortunately, there's not many albums, because they've had lots of lineup changes and there's like 13 years or so between two of their studio albums, so it's sort of like, okay. It's a quite common thing with us, you know, Faith and More, and constantly going on about Tool. And so what's with us is having artists that have huge gaps between albums? Yeah. Well, Tool will never. I mean, at least in this case, we're able to go, yeah, there's been gaps, but we can see new albums have been released. Tool is sort of like, I don't fucking know. <laughs> Please, I want some more music. <laughs> Will we ever get more Tool? Come back in 10 years to find out if it ever happens. may not. Yeah. I mean, if they ever do release their next album, it's going to be one of those, we'll have to do a, like we did with Metallica, we'll have to do a track by track review. Yeah, here we are. This took like freaking 247 years. I mean, I've had like three robotic bodies, but it's finally out. Um, anyway, less ranting about Tool and... On to Alphaville. Or Alphaville, as you decided to call them last time, for no apparent reason. I think you've been playing way too much Doom. Which speaks, it's usually me playing too much Doom. I think it pretty much is just I've seen so many bands with Vile as the name that my brain completely deleted one of the L's. Well, when I mean, you mentioned Alpha, uh, no, Alpha, Vile, the fuck. We did Evile before. Yeah. And of course, we also had Perturbator doing Vile World as one of his songs. Plus playing a lot of Doom. So, yeah, plenty of Vile going on. Yeah, sooner or later, my brain is just going to do a final deletion. That's one for all you wrestling fans! <laughs> the new uh, Superman TV series, Small Vile. Duh. But anyway, yes, yeah, so let's uh, move on from shitposting about words and go on to the actual album. So, the album. This kind of felt like the 80s in a whole album. Yeah, it's, it's very 80s. And frankly, that is a very good thing. Because, hmm. you know, we've done multiple reviews of 80s inspired synth bands. And I'm pretty sure I've mentioned Stranger Things before, and I'm pretty sure I've mentioned Kung Fury before. So yeah, we do have a fondness for that kind of era. Yeah, and we're not just talking in terms of the straightforward, the cyberpunk synth pop aesthetic and sound. We mean all of the 80s. So like, 
Yep, you got synth pop, you got kind of 80s style pop, you got 80s style called funk going on, a bit of disco going on. It's kind of very Depeche Mood kind of sound thing, quite a lot of stuff as well. Yeah. The opening track, I'd say, has a very typo negative vibe about it. Yeah, I can hear that. I mean, the opening track actually is quite a weird one because it sounds quite a bit different to the rest of it, actually. Yeah. Yeah, put it, I was like, oh, this is really interesting, and then it changes style completely for the rest of the album. I was like, okay, oh, fair enough. Yeah. Luckily, not in a bad way. But. Yeah, it's just, it's one of those, The if you heard the first track as a single, apparently that has been released as a single. Um, yeah, the, the track joins. Yeah, from what we understand, there's been two singles released from the album. The first was Heartbreak City, which was a really good indicator of what the album would be like. And actually, one of my favourite songs from the album, and Giants... Which is sort of like, if you heard that as the first song, you would have a completely different impression of what the album's going to be like. Indeed. Also, it seems to me like the vocals in the first track. It's deeper than the rest of it. Yeah. I don't know it's a guest vocal, I thought it's one of the other members using it. Mm. That's what I was talking about with the typo negative vibe about it. The vocals feel like typo negative vibe. Vocals? Vocals. Vikels, they're the vocals that Vikings have. <laughs> Sheikles? Yeah. What? Sheikles. Don't worry. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, just trying to think. Um, standout tracks. This is a very difficult... Huh? Most of it. Yeah, this is one of those... Um, how do we say about standout tracks? I mean, I was writing up my notes and it was sort of like, I have to rank this because of how varied the album is. It's a very varied album, so I recommend you, really, you know, if you want to check it out, listen to all of it, because most of it is quite likely to be different to the other bits of it, so... so. Yeah, um, but it's sort of like, best songs on the album. It's like six of the songs, and this is a 13-track album. So it's sort of like, almost half the album I've got as the best songs on the album. Really strong songs, I've got five. And OK Songs is two. So it's sort of like, fuck, I don't know. Even the OK Songs are pretty decent. So. Yeah. Um, I'd say the, it's actually easiest to say what the weakest song on the album is. And I'd personally say that's Around the Universe. I would agree. It's the only one I didn't really uh, have much of a lasting impression of. Out of literally the whole album. Yeah. It's the only song that, if it wasn't on the album, you wouldn't lose anything for it. I mean, it's it's a good song in its own right. It's kind of got a bit of a um, Faith No More um, Invictus Soul uh, syndrome, whereby because of where it's placed, it kind of suffers from it. Because it's right in between House of Ghosts and Enigma, which are both really powerful songs. Um... House of Ghosts, that's a very, uh, I, I suppose a well duh is necessary here, but I, I have in my notes that it is a very haunted song. But it's more than just what the title suggests. It feels very genuine. If it, it feels like it could actually be talking to someone who really died. Yeah, kind of a death of vibes from that as well, actually. I think you mentioned that uh, Indigo makes a of vibes, but House of Ghosts does as well a little bit. And as a, we both was a pretty huge fan of Anathema, so that's no way about thing. Yeah, it it was one of it was one of those. Oh, it sounds like Anathema. No problems there. Um, but Enigma reminds me of quite a bit of Eternity or Anathema, doesn't it? Yeah, I I was trying to think which era of Anathema it reminded me of. It was sort of like I I I know this is a, from a particular point in Anathema's career, but. I can't, I can't think which album, but yeah, definitely Eternity. But yeah, um, that kind of block on itself is kind of just bookended by two of my favourite songs on the album, those being uh, Mafia Island and Marinette of Halos. Yeah. Both of which are fantastic. I mean, Mafia Island gives me kind of a slight Nick Cave feel to it. Yeah, I, I was saying about how it's sort of like David Bowie mixed by Nick Cave. There's kind of a slight kind of trip hop element there as well, aren't there? Yeah. A little bit of massive attack in there, maybe, as well. It's a really interesting mix. Yeah. I really, really like it. Yeah. So. What really... What grabs me about it is it's a very layered track, and it's sort of... There's sort of responses, musically, 
it's sort of like you you've got guitars responding to the keyboards and vice versa and it really works to sort of weave this kind of very strange story um oh uh one thing i will say uh the song nevermore now that's a very i i'd argue that's more on the ebm side of things than synth pop definitely and what i love about it is it actually feels kind of evil basically when i first heard the song the first thing i heard hearing the lyrics was just freddy krueger yeah yes definitely like my Elm street style to it lyrically at least and i really like that yeah my one complaint about it is i think what they should have done is have two vocalists on it that could work actually, yeah. But I, mean, I can imagine it working kind of... It just kind of reminds me of a bit of uh, Dead Astronauts, actually. Which do have two vocalists. Yeah, I... I uh, just... Both male and female. Because um, with Nevermore, it's a trade back and forth between a person denying Nevermore's existence and Nevermore itself. Um, that in itself, combined with, you know, saying he wants to go into someone's dreams, is probably front row now, street. Yeah. Uh, it's important to note, this isn't uh, Edgar Allan Poe, Nevermore. I, I was contemplating uh, talking about it by doing the Why is a Raven like a writing desk, but it would be a bit redundant because it isn't actually with regards to Edgar Allan Poe. Um, it is much more of a sinister nightmare on Elm Street and other sort of dream, well, nightmare creatures. Um but yeah, I think it would have worked better if there had been a trade back and forth between two vocalists. Mm. I reckon if you do like this song and you do want two vocalists, check out the Astronauts. Mm. Uh, first album, Constellations, came out a while ago, and it's pretty great. They got a new one out that came out a couple of months back, actually, but I haven't listened to that yet. But they're very much worth checking out. It's got this kind of style, I mean, this synth pop, you know, Depression Moody kind of style stuff, but with male and female vocals. Yeah. Um, probably my personal favourite on the album... Well, personal favourites, marionettes with halos, and Rondo... Oh, God. Rondo Voyeur. It's a really awkward word to pronounce because it's a portmanteau. Rondo Voyeur. Um, what I love about it is it's a... This is one of those perfect storms of genre blendings because it's got a bluesy feel mixed with synth-pop stylings and has a progression of rock. It, it's sort of like... Um, That's something they've done quite a few times in the album, actually. Just blending genres together in a really weird way. I like it. The yeah. Fact, the fact that quite a few times in the album they're kind of blending different genres together and it works really nicely. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of like the lyricism and bass line is very much a blues feel, but it progresses like a rock song and the instrumentation is a very synth pop manner combined with those other two styles. So it just. It really grabs me and makes me go, yes. Yes, I want to hear more. Because um, it opens with that really sort of... That heavy blues feel. You know, that blues guitar. Mm. Um, was... well, talking of guitar, it's interesting that Nevermore actually has a guitar solo in it as well. Was... Well, several of the songs have guitar mm. solos. Just... That... True that, but there's Nevermore's one that really stands out to me for some reason. Just... Mm. Uh, at one point, it just goes into an instrumental chunk and it's full of a guitar solo. It's like, yes. Yeah. The song just got even better. Mm. Um, marionettes with halos you know just discussing stylings that felt like if In Excess and Sisters of Mercy formed a super group yeah I can hear that it's got a very much old style gothic rock kind of style to it yeah that beat that beat so good. I just couldn't help but dance to it the first time I heard it yeah I'm the kind of guy that just doesn't dance but it's maybe just good yeah, jig around. Mm. Uh, at first, you expect it to be just a standard synth pop track. I, I say standard synth pop. I mean, we're talking about a, something that sounds like if In Excess and Sisters of Mercy got together. So it can't really be that standard. But you know what I mean. Um, but then the guitars kick in, and it goes from being really cool to fucking amazing. Also, I really like the vocals in this song as well. Yeah. It's, it's one of those... I, I think what really makes it work in terms of lyrics and vocals is it is kind of a railing against um, consumerism and all that sort of thing. But it makes it fun, if that makes sense. You know, yeah. with, with a lot of those sorts of songs, they're very overbearing and you're sort of like, oh, for fuck's sake, can't we just enjoy the music? 
But marionettes with halos, I think what makes it work is it kind of has a bit of a marching feel to it. Mm. So it, is very marching. Yeah. So it very much gets you pumped up for it. I can imagine just going into like a nightclub or something in the 80s and just popping out of the thing. Yeah. The other way can usually be used in a film for similar reasons. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think overall, this is a really strong album. And it, it's one of those, there's not much, even the songs where we're sort of like, eh, they're okay. They're sort of on the, we could easily warm up to them kind of okay. Mm. It's good because if it does have a couple of songs that are weaker than the rest, but just because they're weaker doesn't make them bad. Yeah. It's only because the rest of it's so damn good. Yeah. I mean, I'd still listen to Sexy Land. I mean, that's like if you combined Billy Idol and Tenpole Tudor. Uh, yeah, I can hear that. Um, if you're not familiar with Tenpole Tudor, look up sort of a thousand men. Uh, Anyways, I'm familiar with them because I bought one of their CDs for my dad's birthday last year. Fair dues. I would just give it a listen at the time. Mm. Um, it, it is very much a straight up pop rock song, but because of the placement, because it comes right after A Handful of Darkness, which is a very heavy song, both lyrically and musically, which isn't surprising with a title like that. Yeah, it's a very long song actually, it's only like eight minutes long. Yeah, longest on the album by... Over a minute. Yeah, um... But yeah, because of how heavy that song is, Sexy Land coming where it does works really well as a sort of spirit raiser for how the rest of the album goes. Um, I'd say it opens really strongly. It also closes really strongly. Yeah, they literally just started up um, Beyond the Laughing Sky. Mm. It kind of it kind of reminds me of a mix between Pink Floyd and Nathama and Porcupine Tree. Yeah, I can definitely hear that. I mean, I actually have in my notes clearly taking cues from Pink Floyd, specifically Dark Side of the Moon. Um, which is kind of it's kind of funny that I really like this song because... Because you're not a huge fan. Well, feel, we also enjoy Blackfield, and Blackfield is very David Gilmore. Yeah, so. yeah, but it's especially ironic that I enjoyed this song because I am not a fan of Dark Side of the Moon. Yeah. Um, I mean, with Pink Floyd, it's very much a, I prefer their much earlier weird stuff. You know, I'm a gummer, that sort of thing. But anyway, um, I'm very much a prog rock fan, so I prefer the weird stuff. Um, yeah, Bill Life is kind of a very good ending song. It just kind of relaxes you, and then starts has its own little bit of a intensity you know, towards the end. Yeah. But still in a kind of calming way at the same time, which is weird. <laughs> yeah, I, it's sort of... It, for me, what it feels like is like he's finally expressing a certain level of emotion that the singer has been holding back for the rest of the album. Uh, it's sort of like that's where it's all coming from. He's sort of like he's finally letting go. What's a real title? Yeah, it's, really well, it's a very Nick Cavey sort of title. It is, yes. Well, I think it pushes guy away. Mm. This is a very good song as well. Or seeing Let Push Sky, Push Sky Away, it was one of the best parts of this concert. I was like, yes, it's so good. I absolutely adore Push the Sky Away. I think because that's one of those, whilst it's a very sombre song, it's also kind of optimistic in a weird way. It's, it's very much uplifting. It's like, yeah, everything is shit, but if you just keep on going, you eventually get through it. Yeah, which is also how Beyond the Laughing Sky feels. Especially <coughs> when that sense kick in. Yeah. But yeah. Pretty much every song on this album is really quite solid. Yeah. Um, I would recommend highly checking out, especially if you're a fan of synth pop, if you're a fan of 80s style music in general, a fan of Pink Floyd, if you're a fan of you know, Eurythmics, Anathema, Nick Cave, all manner of artists. The inspirations here are varied. Yeah. And it comes across very strongly in pretty much every single way. Yeah. Um, I... <laughs> It's one of those cases of when your only complaints are very minor ones that can easily, very easily be modified and changed, you know, some point down the line. I mean, it's not like bands don't re-record songs in different formats. And, I mean, how many times have we encountered songs that are re-recorded with additional uh, duets and things like that. Yeah, it's quite common. Um, uh, yeah, final thoughts on the album, aside from definitely check it out if you're a fan of... Music. 
Yeah, this this is kind of a music lovers album because it runs the gamut of so many genres. You are almost guaranteed to find something you'll enjoy. And if you hate life, you're not going to enjoy this album at all. Um, yeah, uh, final score. I'm really not sure. I don't know. I think I may have to go a 4.75. Yeah. It's really, really good. I really like it. I'm actually thinking I'm liking it more the more I listen to it. Yeah. I, I, I'm going to say it's on a 4.75. And by the end of the year, it will possibly be at a 5 out of 5. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm i not sure what... There's not really much to say other than the variation is great. The songs are great. The songwriting is great. The vocals are varied. to multiple different vocalists, as far as I can tell. Yeah. Across the album. And they sound great. The lyrics... For the most part, a great... uh, Everything about it is great. It's just a really strong album. Yeah, and I have to say, this was a very pleasant surprise. The real question now, and the only question I have thinking in my mind is, will I be able to find a copy of it tomorrow when I go into town? Because if so, I'm all right. Because this is an album that deserves to be bought. Yeah. I will not put any problems at all in spending money on this thing. It's it's great. Yeah. I mean, that's the key thing. I am... That's why I'm so frustrated with Steel Panther, because I paid money for that before listening to it. And that's the most expensive coaster that I have ever bought. <laughs> well, apparently it's trending in h right now. Hey. Oh, Alphaville is? No, it's definitely. Oh. I wish Alphaville was. It's just... You, you got my hopes up know, there. <laughs> well, I've seen... Other stuff like uh, Mirka and uh, one of the jewels and Blackfield all trending, so it, it's possible. Mm. Um. Anyway, uh, next episode. Um. Just for future reference, all the episodes, unless something major comes out, like if Tool happened to come out with their new album, we're going to be doing things blind. So we're. It's going to be a case of we don't know the artist and we haven't heard anything about it. So it'll be an experience as much for us as it will be for anyone else who doesn't know it. Um, so looking through things. Um, hmm. Well, next episode. I'm not sure when the next episode will be recorded. Uh, Whenever something interesting comes out, I guess. Hopefully in a couple of weeks. That's per usual. But. I mean, Let's see, I mean, on the 14th, there's three bands I don't know. Little Dragon, Little Hurricane. Looking a little something else? Uh, I'm not sure where... Vincent Weiss? Oh, it would be pronounced Vincent Weiss, because it does seem... Yeah, it is actually a German artist, so... Um, Never heard of them. An artist called Actress. I don't know. Imelda May... Don't know. Uh, oh, Rockabilly. Well, that'll be something different. Yeah, so it may well be that. Because that sounds fun. Um, go- we'll either be reviewing Imelda May or Prokol Harum. Not familiar with either of them, but Prokol Harum is prog rock and art rock. So that'll be an experience, <laughs> whichever way we look at it. Yeah, but yeah, we'll be doing something. Yeah. So I guess that would be goodbye. Yeah, we'll catch you next time. It's goodbye from me. And goodbye from me.